Good morning and welcome back to Lombok. This, as you just saw from the lovely title there, this is a Q&A about the Lombok tour where I cycled around the island of Lombok. Now if this doesn't make any sense to you, if you've not watched the series then you should probably just, you should stop watching at this point. Go watch the series and then come back and watch this. If you have watched the series then thank you very much and if you've asked a question I'm going to be answering it now. So I was thinking about the best way to do this and it just makes sense to go for another bike ride. So I'm going to jump on the bike. There's lots of questions, so thank you if you asked. Uh, we're going to get through it. I have to cycle up some more massive hills. What? I fucking hate this. Alrighty, whilst I jump on my bike, I'll just say this is a long Q&A with lots of talking. So to help you navigate, I've broken up the video into individual chapters for each question. All you have to do is use your mouse to scan through the playheads on the bottom of the video and you can find what you want or just have a general skip around. I don't really haze it. <laughs> I love it actually. If you hadn't guessed by the fact I just <laughs> spent six days cycling around the island. That's exactly what you need right now after watching two and a half hours of me cycling around Lombok. You need another video of me cycling around Lombok. Uh, today we're just gonna head up the coast Nothing too strenuous. The weather's pretty naff. We're, we're in February at the moment, so it's the wet season and it's very stormy. Maybe I'll go for a swim. Anyway, let's get these questions on the go. Nisa asks, what did you wish you knew before the trip or what lessons did I learn whilst on the trip that I'll take into my next one? That's a really good one. I think the main takeaway is, is that always give yourself as much time as possible because even though I had like mornings to explore certain places and I did take my time with it, I, I felt like I could have done with more time. So when you're on a trip like this, just try and give yourself as much breathing space as possible so you can stop and really enjoy where you are. That's one lesson. Another thing would be take electrolytes and be a bit more savvy about my calories and my energy my fuel as I go because I really I did bottom out on that first day I hit the wall there so yeah be a bit more sensible especially when you're cycling in a place like Indonesia where it's very hot and it's intense heat you need to be really careful any other lessons there's, there's plenty off the top of my head someone in the comments I think it was Frederick maybe let me know that um, I don't actually need to wear underwear underneath these disgusting lycra shorts i didn't know that so i mean it's probably for the best considering you were there in the room <laughs> indra asks do you like spicy food that's an easy one i love spicy food i think when i first moved to indonesia my tolerance for spicy food was really bad um, but having lived here for like two years now it's a lot better i can i can handle spicy food and i love it um, the stuff that Pakila gave me when I was on the island. Whew, that was the good stuff. That was local and that was spicy. I enjoy that. Somebody else asked, did you look for hotels on the way or book in advance? That's a good question. Um, on this trip, because I'd stayed at some of the places before, I just booked those in advance because I knew I wanted to stay there. But Lombok is full of lovely homestays everywhere so you could easily just you could do it without booking just rock up and there's always going to be somewhere you can stay um desert point which was the last night i had no idea what was going to happen because it didn't seem like there was any accommodation there from what i could see on google maps like the, the places i did find they weren't letting me book or anything so i kind of went there thinking i was just going to have to camp and i just locked out and there was a place Dogs, come on! Oh my god, honestly, the amount of times that happens. You think dogs here would be a bit more savvy with the road? Fucking hell. Where was I? Uh, Lubos, uh, Lubos, no, Lubos. Sorry if I'm getting that wrong. I think it's Lubos. Uh, he asks, best place for accommodation. On this trip, I want to say Gilly Benbeck, but that's not. It's not really accommodation, not yet. <laughs> I'll go with either Pondok Guru Bakti Cottage in Senaru, that's the first night, or uh, Kita Cottages 
in Sembalun. Both of those, they're like my favorite places to stay in Senaru and Sembalun. Really cozy, very fair price. The views are just ridiculous. Those are my two favorite places, I think. Philip asks, did I buy my bike in Lombok? I did. Um, my friend Etam, who I met, um, I guess through Instagram, but like he lives here, very keen cyclist. You should go check out his Instagram, I'll put it here. He basically messaged me and I, at the time I was looking at getting into cycling and he really helped sort me out. So thank you, Etam. Uh, and he found this bike through a friend of a friend and said, there you go fair price I thought yeah I'm gonna have that never looks back it's a nice bike Christine asks what advice would you give to someone who hates to ride a bicycle that's a good question Christine um, if you <laughs> I'd argue if you've watched this series you would think that I don't like cycling and as you'll see in a few moments there are times when I don't enjoy it we're about to go up this stupid hill with a silly gradient and I don't know why the people of Lombok who built these roads decided this gradient would be okay <laughs> back to your question oh god I hate I really hate hills I do hate hills so my advice if you don't like cycling don't do it <laughs> don't <laughs> just don't put yourself through the pain oh god now if I'm really trying to twist your arm and persuade you oh god honestly it's great fun it's really good you'll love it if I was trying to get you into it I would say just start just start small go for a short ride you don't have to dress like a weirdo like me um, and just sort of ease yourself into it and wear uh, you know what you do have to wear these because if you want to be comfortable and have a slightly more comfortable ride, you need a padded arse. So, there you go, maybe just don't. If you don't like cycling, don't bother. That first hill's just killed me off. King Merm asks, how much money will we need to raise for you to do it again in a few years? But this time all in one go. <laughs> all in one go. I mean, that, that would kill me, so that's a lot of money. Yeah, there'd be a lot of money, because you'd be, literally, that would be the end of me. King Merm also asks, any issues being on the road as a cyclist? And James asked a similar question. He said, did the roads ever feel dangerous? Are the drivers respectful of cyclists, or did you have close passes? Um, honestly, no. Honestly, it was, for the most part, completely fine. Um, the majority of drivers out here are on two wheels as well. They might be going a little bit faster than me, but when you're on two wheels and everyone else is, you can kind of just merge into the traffic and use the same rules as they, as they do. There was one time, thinking about it, I'm pretty sure there was a time, I think it might have been on the last day where a truck did, it was a little bit too close. I think it was the last day. I'll put the clip in here. I mean, there's always going to be some dodgy drivers, but for the most part, the roads felt pretty safe. Somebody else has asked, what is inside my bags when I was cycling? What did I take with me? I thought about how to answer this one. And I was like, oh, I could physically on camera go through each item and explain why it's in there. And then I just thought, no, I'm, I'm honestly too lazy. So here's a flat lay image. I very kindly laid out at the start uh, and that was what was in my bags <laughs> it's basically a mix of cameras charging gear batteries and then essentials like sun cream stuff to fix the bike spare change of clothes just the bare essentials really sleeping bag and tent and yeah by the way laying out that gear that flat lay gear at the start like what a joke who i can't believe there's psychos doing that every time they go away that was so much effort. I'm not doing that again. Alex asks, has the tour, ch has the tour, has the tour changed you as a person in any way? Oh, it's a big question, Alex. That is, we're getting deep now. <laughs> I wouldn't say that it changed me. It sort of, it just kind of like reaffirmed 
for me who I am and what I enjoy. So I kind of, before I did the tour, I already knew that I was really going to enjoy it. And it just confirms like, I'm really enjoying sort of stripping everything back, spending more time in nature, like the health benefits of it. Um, and as, as a form of travel, like slow travel, all of those things I'm really interested in doing more of. And that's the kind of the direction I'm heading as a, I don't know, <laughs> filmmaker, traveler, person, whatever. Like, so it kind of just confirmed all of those things. Like, yes, this is what, this is what I enjoy. And this kind of trip really brings out the best in me. Hello. Hello. Hey. Yes, boys, get those miles in. So yeah, I hope that answers your question, Alex. Um, Domonkos, 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 sorry, I'm really shit with names. Domonkos asks, apart from your wife, what did you miss the most whilst being away? That's a good question. Um, he said, did your appreciation change for anything in life? Did you realize you under or overvalued certain things? Good question. These are, these are really getting, digging into the whole idea of the trip. Um, I would say that I'm becoming less and less of a materialistic person. And that's, I know that's ironic because I just showed that flat lay of all that stuff, but I, yeah, I didn't miss anything to be honest with you. Maybe that would change if I was away for longer because it was only six days, but I didn't really, yeah, I didn't miss anything. It was like, it was what I wanted it to be. Like I, I kind of fantasize about just kind of like dropping everything and and just heading off on a massive journey somewhere and you know that kind of like cycling nomad life <laughs> i reckon i could do that uh, and that is an interesting thought a scary thought sometimes yeah i don't think i really overvalue anything now it's it's nice to have the things that i have but your happiness isn't really tied to anything materialistic. So yeah, I missed my wife and that was about it. <laughs> I don't really need much. I just got my life on my bike, just riding around. I'm the happiest man alive, bro. Ashley asks, what did you enjoy the most and why? Good question, Ashley. I think the obvious gimme answer would be Gilly Benbeck. Um, Spending a night there and the morning after was just incredible. I'm really, really glad I did that. That's on a surface level. Um, I think on a deeper, more meaningful level, what gave me joy was the whole, the, the narrative arc of my brakes breaking and kind of being down and out and thinking that was it, the trip was done. I genuinely thought like, there's no, I'm fucked here. Like I was on the east side of the island where there's not, I couldn't find a bike shop on my Google maps or anything. So. Going from that to then having uh, Uchok and the, the engineer, the engineers, hey, not the engineers, the uh, mechanics. They may as well be engineers, they're bloody brilliant. So going from that sort of down and out to then the revival and the brakes were fixed and these people had helped me out, that was my favorite bit of the trip, I think. See you. Enjoy your holidays. Thank you very much. I hope you can enjoy your uh, holidays in Lombok. Thank you, man. Samba Jumper. Okay. Thank you. Take care and take it easy, George. Yeah, man. Thank you very much. Yeah. Look at this view. We'll stop here for a moment. The weather is not the best today, but isn't that nice? Beautiful. I love cycling up the coast, as, as you saw in the video. This is the bit where you swoop around the corner and you get this view. Yeah, absolutely stunning. Uh, next question, whilst we're here, where are we? So somebody asked me about my physical training and diet. Uh, I didn't have like a strict diet. Uh, uh, surprise, surprise, like <laughs> look at me, scoffing my face on the whole trip. Uh, there's no strict diet or training plan. It's just more about staying fit in general. So for me, I have through the, through the pandemic and living here, just kind of realized like the health benefits, like physically and mentally to just be in shape. So I try and keep in shape. I, I go for a run, 10K run every morning if I can. 
not religious about it, but I, I do try. And then cycling. I've obviously, I've gotten into cycling over the past year. So, and when I was planning for this trip, I did try and make an effort to test out the bike with the panniers on it, weight it up. Uh, so I did a few test runs. I do a big loop, which maybe we'll do in another video someday. Um, I do a big loop. It's about 60 kilometers through the hills and along the coast back home. So that was my training. I just did that a couple of times to get a feel for what does it feel like on the bike with all that weight. Uh, and that was it. I just went <laughs> and I think I was okay. Like I was physically in a very good place. And even more so after the end of that trip, I was in real good shape. <laughs> the Moncos asks, the Moncos, you've asked a few questions. Thanks mate, I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, how much time did you need to recover physically? Don't want to sound like a bit of a smug bellend, but I was fine. <laughs> I want to say, well, I was weird. I was expecting that it was going to be, it was going to take a real toll, but I was sound. Didn't take much time at all. It was like, yeah, it was almost like the next day I was good. I had a great sleep, like a really big long sleep and that was it. So I don't know, I have no idea why. <laughs> Maybe it's all those Pringles I was eating. <laughs> Pringles, mate. All right, getting back on the bike. I'm just gonna cycle down around this bay, up the hill, and then over to the next, the next bay. Look at that. Big bastard monkey, I see you. Hey them. Do not feed the monkeys. Oof. Oh. Nice. This will do. I love this spot. All right. This next question I wanted to sit down. It's an important question. Adlini asks, were there any safety or crime concerns? How did I manage those? And the Moncos asks a similar question. He says, you mentioned all the positive impressions you got from friendly locals, but also when you stayed on the island for a night, you talked about having a knife with you. How safe did you feel on your trip? Good questions, Adlini and the Moncos. Um, yeah, in general, I have zero safety concerns here in Lombok. Uh, I've lived here for almost two years and I've never, ever, ever felt unsafe. And that includes on this trip. Um, so the, the knife thing is more just like a streetwise common sense habit that I can't sort of shift. Um, there was never any risk whilst I was in that tent on the island. It's just kind of like a habit I have if I'm traveling solo, just to be a little bit aware that like nothing was gonna happen. Um, the, the people of Lombok are so friendly and so welcoming. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really nice place to travel, really nice place to live. Um, funny enough, when I did the tail, as, as we call it, I was told, when I told people like my roots and where I was going, I told a few people like, ooh. I've heard it's a bit sketchy. Like whenever I've brought it up with Layla or just about anyone really, they're ooh, ooh, don't go, there. definitely don't get caught out there at night. Don't go around there in the dark. You know, it's like, it's a little bit sketchy apparently. I don't know. I ended up cutting that from the film because it, the tail was like the best. The, the people there were the friendliest. Uh, lots of big smiles and stopping to chat. But yeah, I had the complete opposite experience of what people told me. So take that for what it's worth. Also take this for what it's worth. I am a male solo traveler. So my experience is my experience. It's different to um, somebody else's. So if you're a female solo traveler, then I appreciate there's, there's all the safety concerns that I might not have to worry about as much. Um, and as, as dudes, as guys, as males, it's our responsibility to make sure that women do feel more safe and, and hopefully they, they can get out of there and do some solo traveling. I think it's a, a really awesome thing for anyone to do. So yeah, just thought I'd put that out there to clarify that's my experience and it, it can be different for everyone else. But having said that, Lombok is a very safe place. The Moncos. The Moncos, mate, we should just do a one-on-one -on -one q and I appreciate all these questions. Um, the Moncos wants to know if the clothes were salvageable or really fermented. That's, I mean, I'm wearing this, so there's your answer. Uh, they were salvageable after a few washes. <laughs> I, I appreciate that 
a running, as I was sort of going through the footage editing, I appreciate there was a running theme of like smell. Like I smelt really bad. <laughs> and it's a good job you couldn't experience that sense. Cause honestly, <laughs> I just spent the whole trip. Like I, I just reeked really, really bad. I can smell my feet right now. It is horrendous. And we're on day two. I dread to think what it's going to be like by the end of this. The smell. Oh, literally, I can smell them now. It's bad. So yeah, I'm glad that the... I like this. I like this a lot. Uh, I'm glad that I was able to salvage these. <laughs> Cedric asks, what's the hardest thing about filming the series? Yeah, that's a good question. And then Mike also asked, a lot of these shots are pretty tough to do by yourself let alone while riding a bicycle. Tell me about it, Mike. <laughs> Tell me about it. Uh, it would be amazing to know how all that went down. But yeah, so those two questions, very similar. What's the hardest thing about filming the series? And um, The hardest part of the whole process would be those shots where I have to stop, get off the bike, get the camera out, set the camera up, press record, get back on the bike, cycle up the big hill, stop, come back down, grab the camera, walk back up, get back up, put the camera in the bike, get back on the bike. That was a ball ache. That was really annoying. <laughs> Not doing that again. And eventually, I, as I went through the footage, I noticed on the last few days, I just stopped doing that. <laughs> and I don't blame myself at all. That was a real pain in the ass. Um, and linking into that, Stu asks, did you drive around the island first to do all the aerial shots? No, I actually did some of it after. Um, so some of the drone aerials that you see, I filmed on the day, um, got off the bike and you know, oh, that looks nice, I'll get a shot. And then other parts, I simply, I didn't have enough time. Um, so for example, when I was rushing to meet Pakila, I just need to get from A to B really quickly. I didn't film any drone footage and I went back on a future date a couple of weeks after and got those drone shots. Cause I felt like the, the aerial shots really polished the film and it, it shows off Lombok in the best way possible, I think. Uh, I don't know, you tell me. I feel like it helped. Um, it gave a, it added a lot to the film. So yeah, it was worth me going back and picking up those aerial shots. It was a lot of effort. And I think the, the takeaway from those last few questions is that it would be nice in the future if I could just have a small team with me and there was someone getting those shots of me on the bike and someone doing the drone stuff. Um, that would be really good. I'm hoping in the future that might be something that happens once I get an actual budget to work with. <laughs> um, but for now, it's a one-man band and it is, it is hard, but I enjoy it. I really enjoy it. So. We're gonna switch this camera angle up. You're gonna go down there. No, you don't, no, that's a ter sorry. Sorry, let's sort this out. I'm really sorry you had to see that. Look at me doing my hair. <laughs> As if <laughs> you've seen me at my worst, there's, there's really no need for me to worry about how I look right now. <laughs> you've seen the worst of it. Okay, next question. The Moncos. To Moncos, mate, you are sorting me out. You've provided a lot of material here, thank you. What is your method for learning the language? That's a good question. I don't have a method. Um, I was doing Duolingo for a bit when I first came here and it did, yeah, it kind of helped, but at the same time, it, it quickly became a game. Like my brain kind of like just hacked it as a game and then I stopped like taking in what I was learning. So I, I've stopped Duolingo. Um, Basically just by living here, I've picked up very basic conversation. I can hold like a basic conversation. So the usual questions of who are you? Where are you from? How long have you been here? Do you have kids? Those are the kind of questions you'll get when you first stop and talk with someone. So I can navigate that, but my, my Indonesian sucks, if I'm being honest. It's a bit embarrassing. I've been here over two years and yeah, it's not that good. I want to get better this year at Indonesian. So that's on my to-do list. Um, I think, don't want to dig anyone out here, but as British people, if you're a British person watching, I reckon, I have a theory that we're really lazy because we kind of just rely on everyone else speaking a bit of English. And a lot of people here do 
speak English. Um, so it makes me lazy, I think. You know, a lot of Europeans and a lot of people around the world, they just learn two languages as default. And I'm kind of jealous of that. I, I really suck at languages, but I want to get better. There's no excuses really. And when you can speak the local language, it really does open up a lot of doors. For example, Pakila didn't speak any English. Uh, we somehow kind of bumbled through on broken Indonesian and it was fine and I enjoyed that experience. But it'd be nice if I could speak better Bahasa Indonesian. Leon asks, did you have any problems finding friends in Lombok as someone only speaking English? It's as if I line these questions up in a format that made sense. Are people open to foreigners moving there and not only traveling there? Yeah, good questions, Leon. Um, I have, I've had no problems finding friends. Um, a lot of people, like I said, speak English, so that helps. And in general, everyone is just so lovely, warm and welcoming people here in Indonesia and in Lombok. Going back to the safety concerns thing, like everyone's just so nice. So yeah, I've, I've had no problems making friends. And in terms of foreigners moving here, I think it's fine. Just don't be a dickhead. Don't be a bellend. I'm looking at you influencers in Bali, Russian people and other social media types. <laughs> yeah, just don't be a dickhead. Like, if you're gonna move somewhere, you should make an effort to learn the language and understand the local culture, be respectful of that, assimilate into the local community. Like, that's all you can do. That's, and I think if you do that, the people will see that and respect it and you'll have no problems. I'm going to move camera angle again because that one was killing my legs. Where are we going this time? Just moving around my bike here. How about this? Oh, look at that. That's a really interesting angle. That's quite artsy. Cool. Um, James asks, James asked a question earlier. This is just another one of, whoa. Sorry, James. I've laid them out in a nice format. Um, he asks, was that a 360 camera out front? I'd be interested to know what you used to film, how you mounted that front camera and how stable it was. That's a good question, James. This is the secret ingredient to the success of filming this whole film. Let me show you. That's my friend there. He, whenever I'm filming here, he often comes. <laughs> Salam Pagi. So I'll show you now the 360 camera. I'll show you if you want. Okay. <laughs> So I've got my bike and um, basically at the front I had a handlebar mount and a big long selfie stick which looked ridiculous as I was cycling along and then <clears throat> down here at the end of the selfie stick is a 360 camera and then as you've seen in the footage the 360 camera basically stitches out this selfie stick and makes it look like someone's sort of filming me in front. Now. The interesting bit about this, James, I did not use this specific 360 camera for the trip. I will now cut to the one I used. Just like that, we're in my garden back home. The magic of editing. So, as I was saying, this is the selfie stick and the 360 camera that I used. This is a GoPro Max and it was okay. Nothing to write home about. Um, the main problem was, and I didn't show this in the video, but as you can see here, I don't know if you can see that, this is a DIY job. The selfie stick actually broke on the first day and I had a nightmare with that because I was relying on this to film um, the majority of the trip. <laughs> like This is the way I communicate and, and give all my pieces of camera on the bike. So for this to break on the first day, was it was not great. Um, so you can see here, I don't know if you can see that, like I basically just taped it up and super glued it. I reckon I could just break that off right now. There we go. This is a really, I mean, <laughs> don't worry, I've got a new selfie stick as you've seen. Um, so yeah, that wasn't ideal. And the, the problem with the GoPro 360 itself was that the audio on it is terrible and you can't record uh, external audio, so I couldn't plug in a mic and record anything. So the way I had to work around that, as you probably saw, basically I have this camera out front recording the visuals, 
and then I had uh, the camera I'm using now, the little Sony ZV-1 I think, I had that in the cockpit facing up at me and basically had to press record on that and this roughly the same time and sync the audio from the Sony to the visuals of this and you can just imagine how much of a ball ache that is. So, the reason I now use this is because the Insta360 X3, I can basically plug in this audio straight into the Insta360 and record audio without having to faff around with syncing up audio with another camera. It was a real, it was a pain. So I'm, I'm really happy I have this 360 camera now and it's made my life a lot easier. So if you're, if you're thinking of filming a bike tour and yeah, a 360 camera, this one in particular, the Insta360 X3. Hope that answers your question. I think he enjoyed that. I have, I have an audience. <laughs> it always puts me under a lot of pressure. Every time I come here, this guy comes and watches me. <laughs> um, Mike asks, also would be curious to know, what were some of the toughest spots that didn't make it on camera, um, where filming, cycling, or other logistics went wrong? And what did you do to overcome them? Honestly, honestly, Mike, I, I got really, really lucky. There wasn't really much adversity, apart from on the first day, as I just explained, my selfie stick broke and I had to do a DIY fix. But apart from that, nothing went wrong. I didn't even get a flat tire. I was, I was adamant I would at least get a flat tire. No, no. I got very lucky. There was nothing that went wrong. Um, I didn't show. I didn't show much of it because I was trying to keep the story flowing. But I think down at Tanjung Ringgit, where the lighthouse is, that there was a lot of um, you, the, the tarmac sort of finishes, and then you end up on this very rocky, bumpy road. Like I was getting knocked around. The bike was getting battered, and it was very hot and sunny by that point. So that was quite an intense, intense part. Um, yeah, I'd say that was the toughest part, apart from all the hills, obviously. Mike also asks, what does he ask? Let me just check. He said, things that happened that surprised you, positive or otherwise, that didn't make the final cut of the film. That's another good question. Um, to be honest, most of what happens you see in the film, there wasn't much left on the cutting floor, which maybe that's because I'm a really great filmmaker. <laughs> now, there's, there's always, there's always stuff that you, you leave out. Um, so for example, there was a Tanjong Ringgit. The reason that I admitted this was because I was just trying to keep it flowing, as I just said. So Tanjong Ringgit, there was a guy I bumped into out there, a German tourist. I was like, what are you doing here? And he looked at me, he's like, what are you doing here? And he probably looked at me twice as hard because of what I was wearing and what I was doing. He, was, he had more reason to be weirded out than I was. I just couldn't believe there was someone else out there. <laughs> Um, so I had a quick chat with him. Wasn't expecting that. <laughs> See you. <laughs> God, I must look so weird. Wasn't expecting to see anyone else here, but this guy popped out of nowhere. He probably must have thought, like, what the fuck is this guy? Like, look at me. Oh dear, not a very good first impression. <laughs> he was like, I, I told him I was like riding around the island and I was gonna ride from here to Kuta today and he didn't say it, but I could see in his face, he was like, what the fuck? He was like, what is this guy doing? Which is fair comment. I, I didn't cut that in because it was just not really relevant to the story. Another bit was on the second to last day, just after I came off Makaki Hill, uh, it actually started raining for the first time, so it, yeah, I got a little bit wet, but I found shelter pretty quick. And maybe if it had been raining for a longer period of time, like the whole afternoon from that point onwards, it might, it might have been a feature in the film. But it, it only lasted about 15 minutes, so I just cut it out. And I did get lucky with the weather, definitely. Uh, it was a little bit surprised to even have that rain, because I did it in August when we're still supposed to be in the dry season, but it's been very wet here in Lombok recently, so it was a little bit weird to have some rain on the trip. Lots of little clips that I would cut out would be like 
in Gili Bembek, for example, the ants overnight completely ravaged the food that I had left over. So, I did have one slight issue, and that is the ants. I should have seen that coming, really. They've gotten absolutely everywhere. Look at that. All over my scran. That was supposed to be my breakfast. Ashley, who asked the question earlier, would you consider doing the trip in reverse sometime in the future? Hmm, good question, good question. There's so much, there's so much else out there that I would be more inclined and more interested in doing those, those trips first. Uh, and I, oh, I can't imagine having to climb up to Sembalun the way I came down when my brakes broke. That would be, oh, that would be hell. I, I do, I do really love spending time here and exploring the island, so never say never. Oh wow, we're on to the last two questions. Thank you if you watched this far. Um, Cedric asks, do you still have places you haven't been to in Lombok, somewhere new to discover? Good question, Cedric. This trip, yeah, this trip was all about seeing the, the islands and seeing the parts that I hadn't yet been to. And I got to do that and it was fantastic. Um, so, you know, the east part of the island and the tail and desert point, all of that. Um, but believe it or not, there is still one place that I haven't explored yet. And that's when, when I cut the T-junction and turned right to head up to Sembalun. If I, if I turn left, that's a part of the island I haven't done yet. And it basically just goes around the, the northeast part of the island on the coast. So there's always somewhere new. Uh, for such a small island, it's amazing to me that there's still so much more out there for me to see. So, yeah, there's always more. Last question comes from Stray Bob. Bob. Bob is a fantastic filmmaker, YouTuber. You should go and watch his stuff. Honestly, one of my favorite channels on YouTube. Go check out Stray Bob, he's great. And he asks, would you do another bike trip? The answer is absolutely 100 million percent yes i would definitely do another trip i loved every second of it i know that at some points it didn't seem like i did enjoy it very much i was in a lot of pain but i think bob you understand this and other people maybe get it that like in the moment you might be hurting and in pain and but there's something about that kind of slower travel and, and putting yourself through that challenge i really loved it i think it's a fantastic way to travel you really slow down. I talked about this in the film, about slowing down and really getting to drink everything in. So I will definitely be doing another cycle trip. The only question is where, really? Like, the world is my oyster. So I have lots, lots of plans about that. I'm not gonna turn the channel into a cycling channel. So <laughs> don't worry about that. It's, it's much more about, like, travel and adventures for me. So, and whatever form that might take. But yeah, I'd like to think that if I get to a ripe old age, fingers crossed I'm lucky enough to live to a ripe old age, I'd like to think I have a few more of these under my belt. Um, so there will be more. Yeah, I, I've, I've got to plan the next one and see where it takes me. <laughs> uh, that's it. That's it, guys. Home time. Ah, didn't even get my swim. Okay. Saya pulang ke Sanggigi. Sampai jumpa lagi. See you. All right. That's it, boys and girls. Thank you so much for asking all those amazing questions. I really appreciate that. I actually, yeah, I enjoyed this because it felt like we were able to have a two-way conversation rather than you just having to watch me toil and um, sweat and swear and be in horrendous pain going for a big hill. It's actually like we were getting to know each other. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 <laughs> See what I mean? People are lovely here. Well, that was great. I... We should do more of these if you want. <laughs> Um, so yeah, thank you for watching. I, honestly, the feedback I received from the series has been phenomenal. So nice. I had a blast 
making it and it looks like people have enjoyed watching so that's all i can ask for it's been fantastic um look out for more stuff this year make sure i don't die as i cross the roads otherwise there won't be any more stuff this year um yeah i've got like another series of the lombok life which is in the works. I appreciate it's taking me a very, very, very long time, but you'll see why. I'll get round to explaining why. Um, it's ready when it's ready, trust me. And I've also got another series uh, walking around the Annapurna circuit, which I did reference very briefly in the Lombok tour in Nepal. Incredible place. Uh, I'm really excited about that one, so that will hopefully be coming out later this year. Yeah, in the meantime, take care. Thank you so much for watching. If you've watched this far, I'm pretty sure I can count on you to um, do me a favor and just sort of spread, spread the word about this series. Like, if you enjoyed watching it, please consider sharing with someone else who, who you think might enjoy watching. That would really help me out. Yeah, okay. I've got to cycle back up all those big hills. <sighs> God. I'll see you soon. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. Oh, hey. Morning. morning. And then this is just going to be a, whoop, a little end card and a video here saying, hey, you should watch. You should go and watch the Lombok tour that you've definitely already watched. Could be something else. Maybe there's something down here saying go. Go and watch this. I don't know. It's just, uh, I mean, no one's watching by this point. It's the end card. Shut up. Shut up, Josh. God's sake.